Would you sell your soul to Jesus Christ? We're going to have to answer three questions in this study. First and foremost, is it possible to sell your soul to Jesus Christ? Secondly, what is your soul? Good question. And thirdly, what do you get out of it? You sell your soul to Jesus Christ, what do you get in return? We're going to look at those three questions today. Is it possible to sell your soul to Jesus Christ? Yes. Let me show you the scriptures to back this up. Matthew chapter 16. King James Bible. Look it up. Search the scriptures to see if these things are so. A lot of people make the mistake of just listening to internet preaching and they get some preacher up there and he's just ranting about the Bible says this and the Bible says that and he's not telling you to turn in the Bible to check him out. That's what you're always going to get here when you hear me preach. I always say, get a King James Bible, look up the verses, make sure I'm telling you the truth. Very rare on YouTube nowadays. Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 through 26. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Here it is. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Can you sell your soul? Yeah. You can give things in exchange for your soul. You so say, what is the soul? We'll get back to that. But very important thing to understand there. People do sell their souls. And I would recommend that you sell it to somebody who's worth, you know, taking uh, possession of it, taking ownership of your soul. Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, verses 16 through 21. Let's read there. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought, brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. Here we go again. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. The man is speaking to his soul. We'll see later on what the soul is. Very interesting. Verse 20, But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall, shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself, and is not rich toward God. Uh, there's this whole thing with Hollywood actors and whatever else, and the politicians and things, that they have to sell their soul to the devil in exchange for wealth and, you know, power and fame, whatever else. And I do believe there's some truth to that. I believe that you get into that stuff, you get, you know, into Satanism and whatever else. You get into the Freemasonry, you get into the higher levels of the Jesuit order, Knights of the Equestrian Order, order uh, Catholic Knighthood. I mean, check it out. I mean, you, you know, you can say it's conspiracy. Well, whatever. It's there. You can see that these people are members of, of secret societies and things like that. They are selling their soul to the devil to get into the positions of power that they have. Certainly. Um... But in reality, what they're really doing is they're trying to keep their soul for themselves. They're trying to be profitable and, and, and gain wealth and whatever else. So they will sell their soul to obtain that wealth. They'll do whatever they're told. They'll do whatever they have to do to make that money. Mm -hmm. That's what that rich man did. But God will get to a point where he'll say, okay, tonight... This night thy soul shall be required of thee. Who did you sell it to, rich man? What all did you do to get that wealth? What all did you do to get that fame and fortune? I'm going to require of you your soul tonight, the Lord says. And it's going to happen to every one of you. It's going to happen to me. Someday I'm going to have to stand and give an account for what I've done with my life. That's why I sold my soul quite a few years ago. To the only one who's really worthy of having it. The Lord Jesus Christ. My Savior. My God. And He owns me. Getting ahead of myself. Turn next to Psalm 72. Back to the Old Testament. Going to be looking up quite a few scriptures today. If you'd rather hear some guy up, you know, telling you nice little things that you want to hear, then go watch Joe Olstein or some other fake but I'm going to give you what the scriptures say. Psalm 72, 
verses 12 through 14. For he shall deliver the needy when he crieth, the poor also, and him that hath no helper. He shall spare the poor and needy, and shall save the souls of the needy. Are you poor and needy? Good chance that you are. You can't say that you're a rich man, that you have all kinds of things laid up for many years, and you're doing just great and whatever else. Maybe maybe that's there. But I think most people that would view this video are going to say, yeah, I'm, I kind of fall into the poor and needy category. Uh, God wants to save your soul. He wants to redeem it. Hmm. You're worth something to Him. You're not worth anything to this world. This world should care less about you. Who are you? You walk down the street, nobody comes up and says, Oh, I, such an honor to meet you. They just, you're nothing. But you're something to God. He's interested in your soul. Uh, verse 14. He shall redeem their soul from deceit and violence, and precious shall their blood be in his sight. God can redeem your soul. Hmm. Psalm 49. Go back to Psalm 49. Verses 6 through 15. They that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother nor give to God a ransom for him. For the redemption of their soul is precious and it ceaseth forever. That he should live for that that he should still live forever and not see corruption, for he seeth that wise men die, likewise the fool and the brutish person, and leave their wealth to others. You gotta love that. Um, all these big, rich, wealthy men that have died and things in the past. What's their wealth mean to them now? Not a thing. They had to give an account of their soul. You see, and uh, they died the same way that the poor guys do. Oh, they might have had nicer, nicer accommodations in the hospital or whatever else and nicer bed to die in, but they still died. They're still in the ground rotting, worms eating them. Or if they're, you know, encased in, in their mummified corpse someplace or whatever else, they're still dead. You know, you go in and there's a some guy, Steve Jobs or whatever, the, the guy that created Apple computers, you know, and he died, he had all kinds of money. Um, he, his, his corpse rots and stinks just like the poor guy that was uh, barely had two nickels to rub together. They're both dead. Hmm, what about their souls? See, that's what's important. That's what I want to get through in this study here. Your soul is what's important. That is what you really are, your soul. This body of flesh isn't really what it's all about. And yet most people think most about this body of flesh. Let's read here, verse 11. Their inward thought is that their houses shall continue forever, and their dwelling places to all generations. They call their lands after their own names. <laughs> Gotta love that. Um, the Trump Tower in uh, New York, I guess it is there, whatever. Oh, it's so fabulous and whatever else. Just going to rot, fall apart someday, just like Donald Trump, who, uh, by the way, is in the position of president because he's a Jesuit. Secret society membership and things like that. Okay? Sold his soul. You understand? Verse 12. Nevertheless, man being in honor abideth not. He is like the beasts that perish. So oh, I reject the Bible. I'm an atheist. Okay, what about that statement right there? You believe that man is a beast. Man's just a little bit more evolved beast than a monkey or a grizzly bear or a dog. Why would you find that statement to be uh, offensive? Just a beast that perishes. When it comes to death, that's true. Um, be, uh, animals don't have a soul. That's the difference there. But let's continue. Verse 13. This their way is their folly, yet their posterity approve their sayings. Selah. <laughs> their posterity approve their sayings. Oh, you know, the people that surround themselves, their, their aides and, their, and the people that, you know, work with them and whatever else. Oh, they approve their sayings. Yeah, because they're after their money. That's why they're there. It's a big scam. I mean, you're going to figure it out sometime? Or are you going to still idolize the people that have all the wealth? Verse 14. Like sheep, they are laid in the grave. Death shall feed on them, and the upright shall have dominion over them in the morning, and their beauty shall consume in the grave from their dwelling. 
you know, the uh, Hollywood actresses back there in the early 1900s, a lot of these, uh, I don't even know their names, don't even really care. Um, are they beautiful now in the grave? No, rotted corpse. But you'll worship when you worship them when you see them on the screen. Hmm. Their beauty and their posterity will last forever. Not for them, it won't. Um, they would have done a lot better thinking about their soul than their flesh. Thinking about their soul than their wealth. Thinking about their soul than where they live and the car they drive and the people that they know and their acquaintances. Your soul is the most important thing. And you, you have free will to do whatever you want with your soul. Better think about that. Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17, verses 10 and 11. So likewise ye, when ye shall have done all these things which are commanded you, say, We are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. And it came to pass... Am I reading the right thing here? Oh, I'm sorry. Leviticus. Leviticus. <laughs> Not Luke. There goes my perfect reading again. Every time I try to be perfect and infallible like the Pope, because he doesn't make mistakes, you know, ex cathedra and all that good stuff, I always blow it. I'm just not, I, I don't think I'm ever going to be accepted for the position of Pope. As hard as I try, I don't know. <laughs> can't. My soul's already owned by the Lord, so I can't go and, you know, serve the devil like the Pope can. Leviticus chapter 17, verses 10 through 11. And whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel, or of the strangers that sojourn among you, that eateth any manner of blood, I will even set my face against that soul that eateth blood, and will cut him off from among his people. Um, you're doing more than just defiling your flesh by eating blood. It, there's some spiritual application there as well. You're defiling your soul. And by the way, just to... Before I go on to the next verse, let me just give you a, a very serious warning about the thing of eating blood. If you're eating raw meat or blood sausage or blood things, you don't want to mess with that stuff, okay? It's prohibited in three different passages in the Bible, all throughout the Old Testament. Actually, there's a bunch of them. But three main passages you have here in Leviticus chapter 17, verses 10 down through verse 14. You have Genesis chapter 9, verse 4, and you have Acts chapter 15, verse 29. <clears throat> so dispensationally, you can't duck it. It's before the law, under the law, after the law. Okay, so you can't duck that thing. You are not supposed to be eating blood. All right. But let's look here at verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Hmm. You say, well, I better run out and sacrifice an animal. No, uh, you better not, because the Lord Jesus Christ did away with that system. That system's not there anymore. You can't make an atonement for your soul by sacrificing a lamb without spot or blemish or whatever else. The perfect lamb of God was sacrificed on the cross. Jesus Christ died and he shed his blood. And it's the blood that will pay for your soul, redeem your soul. You just saw it right there. You say, well, that's Old Testament. Okay, we'll get to the New Testament. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Beginning in verse 12. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood. Contrary to what the new versions do with this verse, they take out the blood there. And uh, John MacArthur, the, the raving idiot that he is, and I will say that without any fear of contradiction, because he says it's the death and not the blood. Simple understanding of Scripture will tell you it's the blood that makes an atonement for the soul, not just the death that Jesus had on the cross. It's ridiculous. He said, I remember reading a quote, he said that, that Jesus could have been strangled and it still would have meant your salvation. Well, you're rather stupid. There, John MacArthur. It's the blood that makes an atonement for the soul. 
in whom, we're, in whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Would you like to have your sins forgiven? So I'm not such a bad person. Oh, uh, we ought to read the Bible. See how you measure up. See, the Bible has a lot of uh, failure stories in it. All kinds of people through this Bible. In fact, every, every man that's ever been in this Bible, that's ever been recorded in this Bible, they all failed except for one. That's Jesus Christ. Jesus didn't fail. He died on the cross to pay for your sins because you can't do it yourself. You can't earn your way to heaven. You can't live a sinless life. So well, that's judgmental. Think about this, okay? It's judgmental to be just have somebody call me a sinner. Um, it would be if there was no cure. If I just were saying, you're a sinner, you're wicked, you're this, you're that, you say, well, okay, what do I do about it? doesn't matter. You're just a sinner, you're wicked. Here's the point. This is why the Bible condemns you as a sinner, because the Bible then offers the solution. You see, your soul can't be redeemed until you admit that you're a sinner, until you admit, I have a problem. You see? We'll continue. We'll get back to that. Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. Turn to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, speaking of the Father there, which He hath purchased with His own blood. He purchased the church with His own blood? When did the Father die on the cross? Well, you see, there's a being called God that consists of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. These three are one, body, soul, spirit. So Jesus Christ dies on the cross as the body, the soul, the Father there. He can say, hey, that's my blood. Why? Because it's one being. It's one person. Contrary to what the Satanic Trinity teaching says, that there's three separate persons. And you corner these devils that believe in this Trinity thing. A lot of people are just confused on the issue. They've been spoiled by the philosophy of Trinitarianism, called philosophy in the Roman Catholic Catechism, but uh, whatever. People get confused about that. But the ones that really are true, diehard Trinitarians, you pin them right down. They believe in three separate persons, each with their own body, soul, and spirit. That's exactly what they believe. So they have three gods, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, but there's just only one God. You say, well, that doesn't make sense. They say, yes, it's, it's confusing. It's supposed to be that way. Um, God has not given us the spirit of confusion. Confusion comes from Satan. Okay? <laughs> um, <clears throat> it doesn't make any sense because it's a lie. There aren't three persons in heaven, each carrying the title God and yet saying, oh, we're just, I'm not uniquely God in and of myself. I'm just one of three gods, but it's only one God. Nonsense. Absolute nonsense. <clears throat> but he shed his blood and that blood can be there to make an atonement for your soul. He will purchase you. Galatians chapter 3. Go to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. Jesus died on the cross, called here a tree, right? He was made a curse for you. He took your sin and the payment for your sin, and He shed His blood, and that blood washes away your sins, and that blood is the purchase price that redeems your soul. doesn't redeem your body. Your body's still corruptible. I can still sin just like any lost person out there. I can still mess up and still ruin my life like a lot of lost people do. But my soul is a different situation. And I'm going like this because a lot of people think soul's just here. Uh-uh. I'm going to show you that that's not true. The soul's a lot more than your mind and your consciousness. Again, we're going to prove that here in just a couple minutes. But here's the whole point. Here's the point of this study is what I'm trying to say. Your soul is eternal. This flesh is corruptible. So if you spend your whole life selling your soul to improve this, uh, that's, a, that's a really foolish thing to do. 
because you're going to bear the iniquity and the, and the sin and everything else, and you're going to have to pay for it when your soul is required of you by God. When He says, okay, who owns your soul? You never sold it to me, never put it up for sale. So I guess that means that you own your soul. Now you're going to have to give an account for all the bad things that you've done. 1 Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1, verse 17 through 19. And if ye call on the Father, who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. A lot of people out there saying you don't call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. Uh, why? Well, because they're too proud to do it. They're too prideful. They don't want to have to call out to the Lord and say, I'm a sinner, please help me. A lot of satanic movements on YouTube that you need to be careful about telling you that Romans chapter 10 isn't for Christians today. Yeah. Verse 18, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Peter's writing to saved people here. And he says to them, Hey, you know what? You're not redeemed with gold and silver. It isn't some kind of a rich man's club that you got to pay a million dollars and, and some huge big monthly fee to be in or whatever else, some country club or exclusive, you know, th no, no, no. The blood pays for your sins. The blood is there to redeem your soul. And um, that's why you can't lose your salvation when you genuinely get saved. You don't have to work for it because God owns you. And by the way, when God owns you, he will run your life. He will tell you what to do. You become his bond servant. We're going to see that here in just a couple minutes. So, question number two. What is your soul? We've seen that it can be redeemed, but what is it? Well, let's look at the very first reference to soul. Back to the book of Genesis. Second chapter. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, there's the flesh, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, there's the spirit. And man became a living soul. There's the soul. Man is created in the image of God. God has three parts to him. There are three things in God, body, soul, spirit. Man has a body, soul, spirit. You say, I don't, I don't, I don't know about that. Let me show you the scripture. Back to the New Testament, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Three in one. You are looking at a tripartite man. Oh, fancy word. Body, soul, spirit. I have a body that you're looking at. There's a soul within it. And the breath of life that's in me is the spirit. God made Adam that way. And if you look at it, you know, chemically speaking, the body is very similar to dirt. The dust of the ground, the Bible calls it in Genesis chapter 2. The body of flesh, I'm saying. Very interesting. Go next to Job chapter 14. A lot of heretics, by the way, will try to get you on the thing of the soul and spirit. They say, well, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. No, it's not. You know why? Because there's a comma and the word and between them. That's a good indication. You know, I, I know I was talking to a brother about this, and he said that some of these Catholic Vatican versions, like the NIV and New American Standard, not saying those specifically, but those are Vatican versions. Some of these things actually take out the word and between soul and spirit, and they just say soul, spirit. Soul slash spirit. Because they say it's the same thing. They want to make man into two. Body and soul, spirit. Well, that's not true. Man is three. Just, can you read simple, simple English? God is three in one. Man is three in one. Simple. But if you're a oneness Pentecostal, you can't count. And of course, that's... Plenty of other problems as well. 
Job chapter 14 and verse 22. Read that. Here it says, But his flesh upon him shall have pain, and his soul within him shall mourn. Hmm. So the soul, the soul is separate from the flesh in terms of they're not the same or whatever else. The flesh feels pain, but the soul mourns. And you go through the Bible, you start studying what the word soul is all about. It's all about emotions and feelings and things like that. Right? You say, well, uh, I'll show you another verse here real quickly before we go to the next one. Job chapter 10, verse 1. My soul is weary of my life. I will leave my complaint upon myself. I will speak in the bitterness of my soul. Again, you see the emotional thing there connected to the soul. And so a lot of people stop there and they get these great doctors of theology and they say the soul is, is the seat of the emotions and, and it's, the, it's the mind and the conscience. Uh, well, that's there, but it's a lot more than that. Let me show you the proof of that. Um, first, we'll go to Matthew chapter 22. I'll show you another verse here. Matthew chapter 22, back to the New Testament, verse 37. Did I write that down correctly? Oh, there it is. Matthew 22. I'm looking at the wrong one. Verse 37. There's that infallibility again. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. Heart, soul, and mind are connected. Emotions, thought process, conscience. But now I'm going to show you why it's not just the mind. Okay? Revelation chapter 6. Go to Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost, not, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Can a soul talk about themselves having blood? Our blood? Yes, a soul can. Can God the Father, as the soul, say, I purchased the church with my own blood? Yes, a soul can speak about his blood, the blood of his flesh. Why? Because those three different parts are one being, one person. You get it? Verse 11, And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. You say the soul is the mind. Okay, was it a couple little brains over there floating around? Talking brains that could wear robes? Uh, no. John sees bodily forms. They're speaking, talking about their blood that was shed down on the earth. And white robes are given to them. It's more than just the mind and the conscience and the seat of the emotions. It's a lot more than that. The soul is basically a mirror image, I believe, of the body. Paul, when he dies, he says, he goes up, he says, I know one, you know, caught up to the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth. Why? Because he's there and he's looking around and he's seeing heaven, but he's looking down and he's going, where are my hands at? I can kind of feel that they're there. I, maybe there was a little bit of light or I, I have no idea. The Bible doesn't say, but he's, He's perceiving that he's there, but he's, I'm looking around and seeing heaven, but uh, in, in the body or out of the body, I don't know. It was his soul that was called up. If you could somehow take some kind of a special lens or whatever else my, and separate me, my soul would be over here, probably the same height and the same shape of the body and whatever else, but you wouldn't be seeing it like you're seeing my body of flesh. And the soul, you're not going to shed the blood of, a, of the soul. But you can shed my blood, like these martyrs right here. They're saying, are you going to avenge our blood on the earth down there? You see? So the soul and the flesh can speak as the same being. Hmm. Gives a little bit of insight into who Jesus Christ is. But thirdly, let's talk about this, the final part here. What do you get out of it? Okay, you say, all right, I'm going to, if I sell my soul to Hollywood and they like me and I'm, I'm a willing conformist enough and, and, and just a brainless idiot that just does whatever I'm told and fornicates with whoever and, 
and lets people molest me and whatever else. I remember hearing Roseanne Barr the one time, she said that she's been uh, uh, basically raped by everybody and, and they've done everything to her and whatever else to get to her the position where she was at. She's done everything with everybody to get to where she was. Um, Madonna, studying the, the, her life and things, I, I read about it a while, years and years ago, and it just she just fornicated with the right people to get to the position where she is. What's going on? They sold their souls. They destroy their conscience. They sear their conscience. Like the Bible talks about searing their conscience with a hot iron. Why? For money. For fame. For power. I'll do whatever I have to do. I want to be rich. I'll do what I need to do. What are they doing? They're selling their soul. You say, well, I'm such a loser. I'm such a nobody and nobody would want my soul. I couldn't get into Hollywood if I did anything, you know, whatever else. I, could, I have no connections. I have no power. Who'd want my soul? Well, you might qualify for the Lord to purchase your soul. I'm going to show you the qualifications. Matthew chapter 11. What do you get out of it if you sell your soul to Jesus Christ? Do you get fame? Well, uh, I wouldn't say fame, more like infamy. <laughs> You'll be hated by a lot of people. <laughs> Does that count? <laughs> Matthew chapter 11, verses 25 through 30. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. You say, well, see, two separate persons. Jesus is speaking to the Father. They're two separate people. Or it could be the body speaking to the soul. Remember the rich man? I said unto my soul, souls in heaven, how long? O Lord, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on the earth? See, if you're lost, you're not going to get this stuff. If you're a Trinitarian that's, that's diehard Trinitarian, totally hook, line, and sinker, the whole myth of the Trinity, you're not going to get it because you're lost. You're, you're, you know, spiritual things make no sense to you. You're dead in trespasses and sins. So, continuing, verse 27, All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. You're not going to understand the Father unless you understand who Jesus Christ, the Son, really is. We'll continue. Verse 28, Come unto me, Jesus says, all ye that have money and are part of Freemasonry or a Catholic secrets. Oh, it doesn't say that. You really need to write, read along in your Bible, you know. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Do you have depression problems, money problems, health problems, family problems, relationship problems? Are you heavy laden? And I will give you rest. How would you like some peace in your life? You can have it. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. You want to be a bond servant? Do you realize what happens when you sell your soul to Jesus Christ? You become his slave. So, oh, how offensive. It's not offensive to me. I thank the Lord that he bought me and helped me to clean up the mess that my life was in. Put your yoke around my neck, Lord. Lead me around. Tell me what to do. Why? I'm sick and tired of trying to do it my way because I always mess up. Learn of me. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Do you want to know the truth or do you just want to be lied to all your life? Do you want to learn of Jesus? Only can happen if you sell yourself to Him. Lord, I don't want to try to take this soul and try to use it to make money and whatever else. Nobody would even want me anyhow. Will you buy me? I'll be your slave. Tell me what to do. Punish me. Give me a whipping. Give me a beating when I'm wrong. Oh, how offensive to the mind of a 21st century 
human. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The offense of the cross, what the Bible calls it. Verse 29, For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Is your mind and your heart and your conscience troubled? Do you look out there at this world and say, bright future, things are looking better. We're getting into trillions and trillions of dollars of debt. World War III is just about here. You know, just the other day, just uh, the, America killed this uh, Iranian general and things, and they're rattling their sabers for war and things. And, oh, things are getting much better. Uh, watch, my wife and I and son watched a documentary last night about, uh, it's called Pumped Dry, and it's about all the aquifers drying up because Big Ag has been sucking all the water out of the ground, and they're basically going to, they're ruining people's wells in the area, and we're almost going to be out of water. Another probably 20, 30 years, we won't have any water in the ground anymore. What are we going to do? I don't know. Just turn everything into a desert, and you get into all the other things. Is your mind troubled? Would you like to have some rest for your soul? Would you like to know that you're going to go to heaven when you die? Well, I'm just going to kind of hold out for the right deal. I think I got some good things about me, you know, and I can just kind of sell out to the right movement, and I'm going to be making some good money then, and I'm going to have some good friends, and I'm going to have some... Uh-huh. Sure you will. Verse 30, For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Uh, the Lord is going to give you a wonderful life in spite of all the bad things that will come and whatever else as a result of you getting saved. And you know that. That's why people don't want to get saved. You know what it's going to cost you. You know that it's going to mean a changed life. How would I face my relatives? How would I face my wife? How would I face my co-workers? How would I do? Oh, you poor thing, you. Just keep your soul and see where it gets you. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. A lot of professing Christians hate this kind of thing as well. They can't stand the thought of uh, being called a slave. They say, well, I, I'm a servant. I'm a servant. I'm not a slave. Well, uh, that's kind of a weird way to be a servant when you have a yoke around your neck. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? You're not your own. That's not a servant. That's a slave, a bond servant, as the King James Bible calls it. If you are bound to something, you are owned. A lot of people don't want to sell their soul, you see. They want to hold on to it. I just uh, I enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, so I'm not willing to let go of this soul yet. I'm not going to call out to God in desperation and say, God, could you please save me? My life is a wreck. I'm not worth anything. Could you please save me? Oh, no, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm not that bad of a person. I appreciate what Jesus did on the cross for me, so I accept that into my life. And I'll, I'll say by faith I've, um, I've accepted that, and I'm a Christian now, and God's just not going to tell me what to do. I don't think so. Your life's not your own, and your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. You mean the Holy Ghost of God can live within your body, and it doesn't change anything? I don't think so. Verse 20, For ye are bought with a price... Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Property of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right here. I gave up my soul a long time ago. And now he tells me what to do. And when I get out of line, I get a beating. Chastening. That's what that's called. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Living sacrifice? That sounds painful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of painful things that you're going to have to give up. But you know why? Because it's positive. Hey, I want to get you away from those wicked friends of yours, the Lord says. You're mine now. Go away from them. 
Oh, but Lord, I've known them since I was a child. We went through high school together. I was through all the... Yeah, and you go out drinking, don't you? Messes you up. You got you hear those dirty jokes that vex your righteous soul, righteous soul. Get away from them. They're hurting you. They're destroying your future. Mm -hmm. Whatever the Lord does to you in the process of sanctification after you get saved, after you get saved, get that one. It's not before you get saved like Lordship Salvation people teach. After you get saved, when the Lord cleans things up in your life, it's always going to be positive. Every single time. All sin is negative. All sanctification is positive. Righteousness, holiness is positive after your salvation. Verse 2, And be not conformed to this world. How's that going to work if you're, a, if you're going to want to sell your soul like the rich man? How can you say that I'm going to not be conformed to this world, but yet I'll sell my soul to this world? Can't happen. Two totally different things. If you want to be used of the Lord, you can't be a conformist. Oh, it's a hard one, isn't it? But be transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is, what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Renewing of your what? Mind. What is your soul connected to? Mind. How would you like to have a renewed mind? It can only happen if you're bald. Only happen if you're willing to sell your soul to the Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians chapter 3. Let's read about the uh, greatest Christian that ever lived here, the Apostle Paul. Many people would say that. Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 through 14. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Uh, renewing your mind means that you're going to hear the same thing over and over again. And you're going to enjoy it. You'll listen to preaching and say, I've heard those verses before, but sure, it's, sure is good each time. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of concision, of the concision. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. You'll be against your flesh. You'll look and you'll say, I really don't want to be famous. I don't really want to be on television. I don't really want to be a famous rock star or whatever. Nah, not really wanting any of that junk. You'll understand the, the struggle between the soul and the flesh. Verse 4, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Paul's saying it's not that I'm just some loser or whatever. Listen to the Apostle Paul's credentials here. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin and Hebrew of the Hebrews as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. In the Old Testament, you could be blameless. You just go out, kind of like the Catholics, you know, you go and you do your penance and whatever else. You can go and, and fornicate and get drunk and whatever else, but you just go to confessional. Oh, Father, forgive me for I have sinned, blah, 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 you know. And uh, he says, okay, go put 20 bucks in the thing over there and, and do a little bit of, uh, do five Hail Marys or something. I don't, I don't know why they have to throw a football in church. I'd think that that would be bad. But uh, I know what a Hail Mary is. I'm being sarcastic. Okay. Um, but, you know, do these little magical things here and then you're, you're good and you can go back out and sin again. So that's what was going on in the Old Testament. They had the system of law. You can go and you can sin, you can do all these other things, but as long as you go in and you sacrifice the right animals and you do what the priest tells you to do, and okay, fine, I go back out and do the things again. Paul was wicked, but yet he was blameless under the law. Different setup there in the Old Testament. Paul, Paul was a very religious man. Most people would say he was a good man. But what does Paul say about himself? But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss, for Christ. When Christ bought him, he lost a lot of things. He couldn't continue in those old ways. You see? Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. 
Oh, isn't that just terrible? Oh, I can't imagine losing my family. I can't imagine losing my job because I'm a Christian now. and I can't imagine this. New what does Paul say? And do count them but dung that I may win Christ. Hmm. He counted all those things from his lost life as dung. You'll get that when you get saved. You understand that. And be found in him not having mine own righteousness, like most people out there, which is of the law. Old Testament people lived under a faith and works setup. They had the law there, the Levitical law. But that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him. Who? The Lord. And the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect. So he's not saying I'm sinlessly perfect. I'm not sinlessly perfect. And if you're born again, you're not sinlessly perfect either. We still struggle with the flesh. We have no confidence in the flesh, you see. We present our bodies a living sacrifice. But I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, the dung, in other words, and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He's now a bondservant, you see. He's now owned. He's a sellout, you know? Soul to soul of the Lord Jesus Christ. First Timothy, First Timothy chapter twelve. Turn over there. First Timothy chapter. First Timothy chapter one. Chapter twelve. It's three times now I've failed at papal infallibility. And just dashing my hopes at being Pope. It's just terrible. <laughs> See? See, the soul's redeemed, but the flesh still has problems. I'm proof of that. And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. I still don't understand why the Lord put me into the ministry. But I thank him for it. But you see, it's not really uh, my decision. I could have fought him on it and whatever else, but there's really no point. Um, his yoke is around my neck, and he tells me what to do. I've tried to quit a lot of times over the years. The Lord won't let me. Why? Because he owns me. He gives me orders and tells me what to do. And I thank Him for counting me faithful. Even though I feel that I failed Him a lot of times, the Lord just, okay, well, get back to work. And I try my best. I fail. I say stupid things a lot of times. Proof of that. But uh, the Lord counts me faithful. I sure am glad I sold my soul to the Lord Jesus Christ years ago. Sure has been a good decision. Best decision I ever made. Verse 13, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly and unbelief. If you've never heard the gospel before, um, you're in unbelief right now. And God has mercy for you. Um, but you better not mess around. Say, well, yeah, okay, I'm a little bit under conviction, but I, I don't know. I'm not ready to get saved yet. I just want to hold on to that soul a little bit longer. I want to hold on to my own thoughts my own emotions, and I don't want to get caught up in this uh, Christian born-again movement and whatever else. You better be careful of that. Because what can happen is you can start to harden your heart as a result of all that. Verse 14, And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. Okay? Now here's the qualification. Here's how to know whether you qualify... You're the type of uh, soul that the Lord Jesus would like to redeem with His blood that He shed. Okay? Here's the one qualification. You ready? This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. Anybody watching this can accept it. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save Freemasons that are of the right character and temperament. As long as you're freeborn... And as long as you're a faithful member of your local lodge... Uh, oh, it doesn't say that. Christ Jesus came into the world to save Catholics, faithful Catholics that attend Mass every time the doors are open. Or, uh, no, is it attend the local church every time the doors are open? I always get those two confused. Uh, no, it doesn't say that. 
Um, faithful uh, fraternity members? No. Country club members? No. Politicians? Are you kidding me? Uh, no. What's it say? Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And Paul says, of whom I am chief. Are you a sinner? Have you made a wreck of your life? Did you know that that's what Jesus is looking for? You know, I've been around hot rods and muscle cars and things like that, old vehicles. I love old vehicles. Always have for many, many years. I'm 44 years old right now and, and uh, still have a thing for old vehicles. I love them, but uh, I've seen times when people try to fix up a vehicle and they don't do it the right way. It's a bad restoration, in other words. And you think, you know, you really should have just left that vehicle alone there. You really made a mess of it. You know, they try to modernize it or they try to do whatever else to it. And the thing looks terrible and is terrible. Um, and I've never done this on this level, but I've known guys that uh, they'll go and they, they have a specific vehicle in mind. And they'll look for that vehicle just religiously, like, a you know, they just kind of find this thing. And I knew of a guy the one time who literally found, he was driving down the road and he looks over beside this barn, this old barn, this road he doesn't travel very much, and there's this car, and he thinks, that looks like a 1930-something, 19, I forget, Chevy, Ford, Dodge, whatever it was. And he pulled into this farm, and the farmer's there, and he comes over, and he, can I help you? And he says, yeah, he says, what your car is at over there? And the guy says, well, that's a 1938 Ford, we'll say. And the guy says, that's the car I'm looking for. And he said, Can I, do you mind if I just go over and look at it? And the farmer said, oh, sure, help yourself. And he said he went over there and he said that car was sitting there and it was so badly rusted, it literally had a tree growing up through the middle. <laughs> there was a hole in the floor and a hole in the roof and the tree was growing right up through the middle. And he said there was very, very little, there, was, there, there wasn't much that was usable on that car. But that was the car he wanted. That was the car he was looking for. And he said to that old farmer, he said, um, would you like to sell this car to me? And the old man said, you want that car? That old rat trap over there? I, I don't know. It's been in the family. I don't, I'm not really interested in selling it. It's kind of, you know, my grandfather's car, you know, type of deal. And uh, I, don't, I don't know. And he, and he offered him pretty good money for that car. Offered him a lot more than it was worth, you see. And the old farmer said, okay, you got yourself a deal. And that guy took that car. I'm not going to get into the whole story. But uh, he took that car, had a couple of friends of his get in the thing, and, and they drove it. And he said, actually, it's a funny little story. He said he went to pull it out of the spot. And he said he looks back in his mirror. He kind of gave it a tug with his truck, looks in his mirror, and he said he looks and he sees his two friends. All he can see is their legs sticking up in the air. So he looks through the front windshield. And he goes back, what in the world? Well, the seat was rusted off. So he took off, and the seat went back, and they fell back with it. And then the worst part was, that wasn't the bad part. There were mice all through that car that were just in there hidden. And uh, so he goes back and he sees these, this guy and his wife there that were in this old car and she's screaming and whatever else, there's mice all over the place, <laughs> you know. But uh, they took that car back to his shop and he worked on that car and he lovingly restored that car and he did everything he could to fix that car up. It took years, you understand what I'm saying? Um, if you're a mess, if you're a wreck, don't expect God to make you into a show car after one week of Him saving you, Him redeeming you with His blood. It's going to take years, a long time. I'm still in the restoration process, okay, after being saved since I was 26 years old. Um, it's going to be a lifelong process of sanctification. But the whole point is, the Lord is not looking for um, mint condition, totally nice, you know, people souls that and that are just wonderful and great he's looking for sinners old rusted out rotted uh messed up sinners that want to be restored and have a right relationship with the lord they want to have their mind renewed their soul redeemed that's what jesus christ wants do you qualify well i'm not a bad person sorry the lord's not looking for you well, I'm a faithful member of my community. I've done a lot of good works. The Lord's not looking for you. He wants sinners. That's who He wants to save. Um, I pray you get that thing sorted out because there isn't anything more important. 
Don't give your soul away in exchange for the stupid nonsense of this world, the nonsense that's con just currently constantly passing away. All the wealth and everything else that's, that's just digital currency. You don't have a little box in the bank someplace with all your money in it. Uh, that doesn't work that way. You deposit your money, the bank spends it. Okay? Um, it's fake. Your wealth is fake, no matter what country you're in. All right? You say, well, I, I, have, I have my wealth in gold and silver. And how are, how's the pricing of that going? Uh, being manipula manipulated a little bit? Mm -hmm. And whatever else you put your wealth into and whatever else, it's all subject to rust and corruption and thieves breaking in and stealing it. But your soul, that soul that isn't within you, that soul that right now is saying, maybe we better look into this. Maybe I better think about this. Your soul is going to be eternally somewhere. Heaven with the Lord if He purchases you, or in hell with the vast majority of other souls. And by the way, I could have talked about the rich man that went to hell, and he, his soul was in torment. You better think about that. That is going to be it. Thank you very much for watching, and we'll see you in the next video. King James Video Ministries has been faithfully preaching and teaching from God's Word since 2008. Our YouTube channel has never been monetized, and we do not accept money from the lost world because this would violate the scriptures. King James Video Ministries is supported by saved brethren in accordance with 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 17 through 18. If you have been blessed by our videos, we would ask that you prayerfully consider supporting this ministry financially. You can donate online by visiting www.kingjamesvideoministries.com or by sending a check or money order to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 214, Patton, Maine, 04765. Thank you to all who donate to this ministry, and we pray for the Lord's blessing in your lives.